here in Bible study. It is an honor and a privilege for me personally to be here, to have a small part in a very great program. Last evening as we came out of the airport and I looked up into the heavens, it looked like it was going to rain. And I asked Karen if it had rained and she said, no, it's been threatening, but there's been no rain. Well, I'm happy to say I brought you some because at 4.30 this morning I was awakened by the sound of rain and it was raining quite hard and it rained for quite some time. When we moved to Visalia in October of last year, one of the first things the brothers said was, Brother Hackworth, we really don't have much rain here in Visalia. So I said, that's going to change now that I'm here. It did. They got several inches of rain that they hadn't had in a long, long time. And I remember here some years ago when Brother Liddell was here, I was invited to be on this program and there came a storm while I was here. It just preceded me, or perhaps I've forgotten which, it came while I was speaking, but nevertheless it occurred. My name tag says that I live in Foster City, so that's confusing me. I don't really know where I live. This is where we lived for 28 years, but since we've moved, we don't live in Foster City anymore. But if Brother Hatcher had anything to do with the name tags, I can understand that. <laughs> Turn me, with me, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And Jehovah showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the hinder sea, and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees unto Zoar. And Jehovah said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine own eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of Jehovah, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of Jehovah. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping in the morning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as Jehovah commanded Moses. And there hath not risen a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom Jehovah knew face to face. And all the signs and wonders which Jehovah sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, in all the mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses wrought in the sight of all Israel. There are a number of significant factors presented to us in this 34th chapter. I've read this particular chapter many, many times, and I'm sure you have as well. It's sad in some respects. Moses, the great servant of God, the great lawgiver to Israel, John 1:17 a prophet of which there was no life. And yet he was taken to the top of Pisgah. He was allowed to view the promised land as we've come to recognize it. A land which the prophet Ezekiel said when he recorded the words of Jehovah, a land that God searched out, a land overflowing with milk and honey, and thirdly, the glory of all lands. And yet Moses, the lawgiver, was privileged to see it, but yet 
he was denied the privilege to enter it. Subsequent to his death, the leadership of the children of Israel came to be Joshua's responsibility. But I'd like you to think along this line for a moment. Why did God choose Joshua? Surely he was not the only capable servant available. After all, there was Caleb. There were other obvious capable men, but yet God chose Joshua. God chose Joshua perhaps for the same reason that he chose Abraham. In Genesis 18:19, upon the choosing of Abraham to be the father of the faithful, God said, For I know him, I know him, that he will command his family, his household after him, that I may bring to pass whatsoever I have said about him. God chose Joshua, no doubt, for the same reason, because Joshua would be able to bring to pass what God had in mind for his people. And for that same reason, he chose David in 1 Samuel chapter 16, an allusion to which has already been made. The prophet came to Jesse, who had some eight sons, because out of these sons, God had chosen the next king of Israel. In conversation with Jesse the father, all of the sons passed before the prophet. All of them were denied. And then the father was asked if he had any more sons, and yet he had one more, whose name was David, and he was out keeping the sheep. The prophet was instructed to go and contact him because that was going to be, David was going to be the next king of Israel. God chose Joshua, no doubt, for the same reason that he chose David to be the next king of Israel, following the leadership of Saul. And then the New Testament Paul, the record of which, the one that I allude to at least, is in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. Ananias was sent to Saul to engage in a certain action. Ananias was reluctant at first because he said, I have heard how much evil this man has done to thy saints in Jerusalem. Ananias was instructed with these words, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before kings and before nations and before all Israel. Why did God choose Joshua? No doubt for the same reason then that he chose Abraham and that he chose David, and that he chose Paul. To capture a phrase used by Paul in Galatians chapter 1, Paul said, After he had legislated certain matters revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, as I have said before, so say I now again. I'd like to borrow that expression and use it thusly. As I have said before, so say I now again. Leadership is not optional. Unfortunately, some seem to think it is. Maybe this is the reason why we've not produced more of them. I don't really know, but it's not optional. It is mandatory. It is obligatory. If we're going to move ahead and do the work that God needs to be done, there must be adequate leadership. I dare say that you could have a work day at this building without appointing someone to oversee it and really get much work done. I've been to work days in congregations that I've been associated with before, and I've seen a half a day wasted simply because everybody's business became nobody's business. There was no one in charge of the operation, no one to see that the function was carried out. All of them had the ability, but there was a hesitancy to take hold of the situation to provide the leadership needed for that particular task, and so the work did not get done. Leadership has never been optional, whether it's in the form of elders, Titus 1 through through 5, 1 Timothy chapter 3, or whether it's in the form of the leadership provided by the brethren as such, it's still not optional. We have to have it if we're going to move forward. Do you think for a moment that the children of Israel could have conquered the land of promise without leadership? They certainly could not. They would not have been able to cross the Jordan without leadership much less conquer the land. They wouldn't have been able to defeat Jericho without leadership. It just simply cannot be done. An example of this is provided for us, well, more than one, but we'll just look at one, in Acts chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, In those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there rose a murmuring 
of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve who were then in charge said to the multitude, Look ye out from among you seven men full of good report, full of the, the Holy Spirit and wisdom and so forth, whom we may appoint over this matter. Now, whether it was intentional or not, these widows were being overlooked. They were being passed over when the daily necessities were being provided. Well, leadership dictated the policy. The apostolic church, at least the one in Jerusalem, was under the direct leadership of the apostles of Christ for some 30 years of its history, or for some 30 years. So they took charge of that situation they resolved what was a potentially explosive issue. And so they handled it very well. Leadership is not optional. Today, as Michael has said, the theme of my presentation is Joshua, great example of leadership. I want to present two main points and then develop the second point more extensively. First of all, I want to deal briefly with the fact that training is required. For leadership and secondly as time will allow and notice some of the qualities needed in order for leadership to prevail as far as the training is concerned we take a look at the twelve apostles we're told in the book of Luke chapter 6 that the Lord went out to a mountain and he prayed all night to his heavenly father when the next day came, he called the multitude to him, and out of them he chose twelve men. They became his apostles. They became his personal witnesses. They became his personal ambassadors. He would leave the conversion of the world, at least the initial inauguration of it, in their hands. He would not leave them as orphans. He said, I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter. He will be with you. He will bring to your remembrance whatsoever things I have said to you. He will guide you into all of the truth. The Holy Spirit was that comforter. The record of this particular occasion is found in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. The largest part of that discourse is meant for the apostles. Perhaps not entirely, but at least the larger segment of it. These men were to go on to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, but training was required first. The Lord spent some three or three and a half years with them. They sat at his feet. They listened to his teaching. They imbibed his spirit. And now the time would come when they would need to imitate his example. But he taught them personally. He taught them well. And in preparation for their monumental task of preaching the gospel to the whole world, at least to begin it, we're told by Matthew in his account in chapter 10 of his book that they were sent out on what we have come to recognize as a commission that was limited in its scope. They were to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to the whole world. Regardless of what might be said about this commission and the preparation of the apostles of Christ to initiate it and to carry it out successfully, it was mainly for their training that they endured this. So they had to be trained. They were trained by the master teacher himself. And when he left them and ascended back to the place from whence he came, they were ready then to go into all of the world. And so when the time came, as recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they were ready to go into all of the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. They were ready to make disciples out of them through their teaching. They were ready to baptize them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But training is required for leadership. It's not possible to just suddenly take someone from the pew and tell him that he's going to be an elder in the church of the Lord. He's going to be a leader. A number of years has to be spent in training of these men to prepare them for this great work. Joshua was trained. He sat at the feet of Moses. He was with him for a number of years. He was able to listen to the great lawgiver, to learn from his experience, to absorb his knowledge. And then finally it became his task to imitate his leadership. Then there was Paul. In Acts chapter 5, 
a man by the name of Gamaliel is mentioned. An honorable man, a very intelligent person, a great teacher, a doctor of the law. And then in Acts chapter 22, Paul says that he was brought up at the feet of this great man. And furthermore, he was instructed according to the strict manner of the law. Gamaliel took Paul under his wing, so to speak, and he taught him. That has been done, fortunately, for a number of great gospel preachers. They have been taken under the wing of someone more able, more experienced, more seasoned, more knowledgeable, and they have been taught the right ways of the Lord, much in the same way that Gamaliel taught Paul. But training is required. Joshua had it. He had the benefit of being with and serving with Moses. Now then secondly, what about the qualities needed for leadership? We see a number of these qualities manifested in the life of Joshua. First of all, wisdom. A leader must have wisdom. Joshua had it, we're told in verse 9, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. Well, of course, the laying on of hands in order to impart wisdom is not recognized in the church of the Lord today, but the need for wisdom is. James says, If any man lack wisdom, wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, it shall be given him. So it's right and it's good to pray for wisdom, but how do we expect to get it if we do not open the Bible and read it diligently and absorb the sacred words found therein? I find it inconsistent to ask God to give me wisdom and yet never study his word. That would be like asking God to put food on my table and then refusing on my part to go out and work in order to get it. Wisdom is necessary. Leadership must have wisdom. Abraham was a leader, and he had wisdom. You recall the incident in Genesis chapter 13. The Bible says that Abraham was a very rich man, rich in silver and gold and cattle and herds and all sorts of things. He was outstandingly rich. So was Lot, his nephew. He had great herds, great flocks really not poor. And yet as they traveled together, there arose a strife, a confrontation between the people who watched their livestock. Abraham, being the man of wisdom that he was, said, let there be no strife between us. He diffused, as I said previously, a potential explosive situation. Let there be no strife between us. I give you the choice. You may go to the left. If you do, I'll go to the right. You may go to the right. If you do, I'll go to the left. And so forth. And he said, we be brethren. J.D. Thomas wrote a book called We Be Brethren. Abraham had wisdom. And he manifested in that particular instant. Joshua had wisdom. This is why he became such a great example of leadership in the Old Testament. And some of the greatest examples of leadership is to be found in the Old Testament. Leadership is not strictly a New Testament concept. Great men and women of God had it for years and years. Secondly, another quality needed for leadership is commitment. Commitment to a cause. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul alluded to this in part when he said, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. There needs to be a committal. There have been people who have been baptized into Christ without ever having made a committal to him. We're wondering just how valid such baptisms are. There needs to be a committal made to the greatest cause on the face of the earth. And there is no greater cause than the cause of God. And there is no greater subject to be discussed in any lectureship that encompasses or goes beyond leadership. Commitment so very desperately needed. There are brethren, unfortunately, in our brotherhood that also are committed to the destruction of the church. They are committed to the task of leading it down the path to absolute destruction, and of course, this is what the Lord, this is what the, the Satan and the Satanic powers desire. 
we have to have just as strong a commitment, if not even more so, of good, able brethren who are strong and steadfast, who are just as committed not to allow it to happen as others are to make it happen. Commitment is needed. Leadership cannot lead without commitment. Elders in the church of the Lord must be committed to the congregation where they serve to lead it and to guide it and to feed it and to nourish it and to cherish it so that God will be pleased with it and be pleased with them as well. Then thirdly, another quality needed, possessed by Joshua and needed by leadership in general, is the ability to confront, to rebuke, and to reprove that which is wrong. Joshua had that ability. Paul had the ability. Someone has previously mentioned the account recorded by Paul himself in Galatians chapter 2 in a brief confrontation that he had with Peter, confronting him because of his inconsistency. Peter, as you know, had before dined with the Gentiles, which was acceptable. But then when his Jewish brethren came near, he absented himself from the company of the Gentiles, and that posed a problem of consistency and Paul withstood him for it and said I withstood him face to face sometimes that's necessary for our leaders you have to stand up to someone you have to confront them face to face in order to keep the truth the truth Joshua had it also he was able to confront error as he did he was able to rebuke it and to bring the fault home where it needed to be brought. Next, there needs to be the ability on the part of leadership to have courage in the face of opposition. Joshua had this. Nehemiah had it. Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king. It's a wonderful book. It was his task to rebuild the walls of the destroyed beloved city. But he had his adversaries. Leadership always has its foes. It always has its adversaries. Leadership always has to deal with the contentious ones. Just as Nehemiah did with Sanballat, Geshem, Tobiah. They requested that he cease his work of rebuilding the walls, that he come down and meet with them on the plains of Ono. And we can almost hear Joshua saying, or Nehemiah say, oh no. He had time for one thing. He was dedicated to the proposition of doing what God had authorized him and sent him to do. He really didn't have time to go down and discuss with these three men the nature of his work because Nehemiah was a leader. Joshua was a leader. And we hesitated to mention a moment ago the particular phase of Joshua in his confrontation of Achan, the son of Carmi, who touched the devoted thing, which they were commanded not to do. Well, this situation had to be resolved, because they were instructed, that is, the people of God were, to go up and fight with the people of Ai. And so the report came back, after they had done some work of reconnaissance, that a whole army needed not to be sent up only two or three thousand men, which they did, but they were defeated. Well, Joshua had difficulty in understanding this. He fell on his face and he asked the Lord the reason for this. What is the reason for this defeat? And God told him plainly that there was basically sin in the camp. And so Joshua took hold of the situation and located the tribe for the offense. And then he located the family. And then he located the household. He got right down to the nitty-gritty, right down where the rubber meets the road, and he found the guilty party. And he called upon him to answer for his crime, and he answered for it, and he paid for it dearly in the way that you know. This took courage to do this. It's never a pleasant task to have to confront someone over something. Because we like to be people of peace, we like to live in peace, we like to be in perfect harmony and unity, and when there is a disturbance, 
it can always be ignored. Sometimes if you ignore it, it'll go away, but not always. Maybe even seldom. Well, someone has to confront this sort of thing. Someone has to deal with it. The average member of the church does not deal with it. Most members of the church are privileged to come to worship and be a part of an assembly, to sing the great songs that we sing, to pray the good prayers that we pray, and to enjoy the lesson, and then we go home. But leadership doesn't always get to go home. Sometimes leadership has to stay behind and look into a situation, to analyze it, to reflect upon it, to determine how to resolve it before it becomes something more serious. That's what leadership is obligated to do. And that takes courage. But Joshua had it. He confronted these people and called them to answer for him. Just as Nehemiah had done. And then next, the next quality of leadership that we need is the ability to accept and discharge responsibility. If leadership does not have this, then the church will come to a standstill and stay there. It will not go forward, it cannot go forward until we have leadership who will accept the responsibility God has given them and then discharge those responsibility in the God-appointed way. Joshua did this, the record of which at least in one instance is given in chapter 6 of his book. Moses is dead. Joshua the son of Nun is the next leader. God comforts this man and tells him, I'll be with you just like I was with Moses. But I want you to be faithful to me. Be faithful to my word and I will bless you. I'll be with you just as I was with your predecessor. Joshua believed him. They crossed the Jordan and they're standing squarely in front of them. The ancient city of Jericho. What is to be done with this? Well, God told them what had to be done. You know the story. You've read it hundreds of times, no doubt, in your tenure as a Christian. They were to march around the city once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, march around it seven times. Perhaps foolishness in the eyes of skeptics, but revelation in the sight of those who love the Lord. Perhaps even some of the children of Israel were wondering what good will this do? But it required faith on their part. In fact, when the writer of Hebrews reflects upon it, he says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down flat after they were compassed about the desired number of times. The walls of Jericho did not fall by works. The Bible plainly says they fell by faith. But that required faith, and certainly on the part of leadership. It was his responsibility to see that the directions uh, that God had given were complied with. It becomes the responsibility of leadership in every age of the church to see that Christians keep their lives in harmony with the teaching of the Bible. We need leaders such as Joshua who will accept this responsibility and then faithfully discharge it. Next, we need faithfulness on the part of leaders. They must be faithful. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes to this young man, and he said, The things which thou hast heard and seen of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The gospel of Christ is not intended to be to end up in the hands of people who are unfaithful, but to faithful men, because it's only faithful servants of God who will carry out the God-given responsibility. People who are unfaithful will not carry out God's instructions. But His faithful men and women will. And so certainly on the part of leadership, faithfulness is required. Next, there is the idea that leaders must lead and in this instance not follow. But the Coates alluded to the story about the man who caught up with the people that he was supposed to be leading and wanted to know which way they 
had gone because he said, I am their leader. Well, there's more truth in that than you might realize. Elders have to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the congregation is obligated to follow them. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be you followers of me as I follow Christ. Says the King James, the American Standard says, Imitators. So leadership is obligated to imitate the Christ. To provide the leadership so that members of the flock may follow, safely follow, as they follow the Lord. Then last, another quality that leadership must have, of course, is vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision is so important, it's impossible for me or any other preacher, I think, to adequately describe the need for wisdom and for vision. Some years ago, a church in the upper San Joaquin Valley in California were meeting in a very nice little building in a residential district. The city was going to make some changes in rezoning the area. These brethren were faced with a need to relocate because they had no off-street parking. And you know how politics deals with that, at least in California, is very strict. So they were facing a dilemma. The brethren did not have enough vision to compensate for the problem. They could have gone out west of this particular city and bought an acre of ground the direction in which the city was growing. But they did not have the vision to do it, so they ended up boxed in. And this very day, they are still located at the same spot in the same residential area with no off-street parking. And they're dying. And part of this is attributed to the fact that the leaders had no vision. The church of the Lord cannot make progress. It cannot make plans. It cannot work its plan without great men of God who have some vision. It is a necessity. And without it, we simply can't move. In the Bay Area, there's a church boxed in by a boat building institution. They could have bought the property 30 years ago for a reasonable sum of money. The brethren did not wish to pay the sum. Now then, they wish they had because they are boxed in now and can't get out. And not only that, the city, or the state rather, has put up these high walls down the freeway and closed the church off from public view. You can hardly see the sign that says Church of Christ. Why all of this? In part, brethren, it's because our brethren do not have vision. It's because they're not looking down the road. They're not planning. They have no intention of working the plan to be the kind of leaders that will lead God's people forward, not backward, to examine the variables, to see which is the best way for the church to go. That's leadership. And without it, we'll perish. I thank you very much.